Miss Howe take the walk up the wedding aisle to be Mrs. That way. Half the length of my shoe. It's very cold. What oxygen there is is going by at 500 miles an hour. And that first step is six miles straight down. In here, peanuts and magazines. Out there, oblivion. For the 24-hour Sumo channel, press 450. With a powerful move, Rakanohana beat Tomonohana. For Commander Rick, who knows more about science fiction than you do, press 3 for Prisoners of Gravity. With time machines, SF authors can fly forward to the future, pop into the past, or even get caught in a closed time loop. Hit it, Nancy. Or even get caught in a closed time loop. Hit it, Nancy. Or even get caught in... Prisoners of Gravity will begin in just a moment. Club Dave is a virtual interactive service of... Time waits for no man. You can't live in the past. Key sirrah, sirrah. Popular sayings, not in science fiction. With time machines, SF authors can fly forward to the future, pop into the past, or even get caught in a closed time loop. Hit it, Nancy. Or even get caught in a closed time loop. Hit it, Nancy. Or even get caught in a closed time loop. Hit it, Nancy. Or even go into the past and change things to produce a slightly different future. Hit it, Helen. Anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe has voted English only signs and 40,000 tons of oil with PCBs blew up the ozone layer today. travel. In speculative fiction, it's easy. For example, in Mark Twain's hilarious 1889 novel, A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, a foreman at a weapons factory is bonked on the noggin, comes to in the age of chivalry, and discovers it's really the age of pig ignorance. Probably the first intentional time trip was taken in H.G. Wells' 1895 classic, The Time Machine. A Victorian inventor flies forward to the fall of civilization and beyond. Then, in 1941, the fall of the Roman Empire served as the setting for L. Sprague de Camp's classic, Lest Darkness Fall. Why did you send your hero, Martin Padway, back to 6th century Rome? Oh, I'd been reading a lot on what Toynbee called the post-Roman interregnum, the period of chaos after the fall of the West Roman Empire. And uh, I'd also read uh, Graves' novel, Count Belisarius, and was very much uh, hooked by it. So I thought, well, someday I ought to write a story in that setting. And uh, then I put in the time travel element when I, because I knew it was, my market was uh, the science fiction magazines. And uh, Less Darkness Fall resulted. One of Padway's biggest problems is that the Romans all speak 6th century Latin. Now, three years before Less Darkness Fall, you penned an article about the problems of dealing with different languages and early versions of one's native tongues. How far back could I go before I'd have problems understanding English? Well, um, if you went back to the time of, let us say, George Washington, you would uh, note that the English was uh, or orally different from what it is today, but it would still be understandable. And uh, if you went back to Shakespeare's time, your English would be barely understandable by a well-educated uh, Briton. And of course, if you went back to the time of Chaucer, 
It would be completely unintelligible. Juan Maraprilla was assured, thought the drucht of Martha first had told the rota, and by that every vine in switch liqueur, of which vertiu engendered is the floor. I can go on like that, but I'll spare the TV audience. If Berlitz had courses for time travelers, the most popular would probably be the language Jesus had to speak. Nancy, that would be Hebrew or... Ah. Well, the pilgrimage to Palestine is popular in SF. In The Man Who Folded Himself, David Gerald's time traveler witnessed the crucifixion. And the character Carl Glogauer becomes more than a witness in Michael Moorcock's 1966 Nebula award-winning novella, Behold the Man, which Moorcock later expanded to novel length. Michael, why is time travel so compelling? It allows you to bring different periods of history together and make comparisons and see what happens and see where the similarities are. It enables you to analyze your situations, your social situation, I think. That's its main interest to me, the use of time travel. Right. It's simply its literary uses, its literary possibilities. Um, science fiction in general interested me for that reason, what you could do with it, what you could do with the symbols it provided, um, rather than the, you know, the you know, one day man will walk on the moon, which never really meant much to me, still doesn't. So what were your literary motives for sending Carl Glogauer back to Christ's crucifixion in Behold the Man? I was actually thinking about demagogues and how they're created by the people who want them to exist. So it was important for me to find a demagogue that, that really was kind of, you know, had quite a powerful effect on the world. And that way also you can examine the, you know, the religion itself, or at least the, the, the underlying sort of principle of, of it itself. So that was what it was. I mean, it, it, I thought about one Easter, you know, it came to me one Easter. I thought, um, it could have been Hitler, as it were. It could have been any other great demagogue, but obviously Christ is more... In, you know, more important to us all than Hitler, I hope. Um, most of us, at any rate. And, and it, it just seemed the obvious thing to do. I, I really didn't, you know, I didn't think I was doing anything particularly different or unusual. I really didn't. Until I started getting the death threats, you know, then I understood that it had a certain significance for people <laughs> that I didn't understand. One critic noted that if Behold the Man had been written in the past, Michael might have been crucified. But is time travel really possible? To find out, I took time to call science fiction writer John Gribben, who also hosts a BBC World Service radio program called Science or Fiction. And he has a new non-fiction book on time travel called Unveiling the Edge of Time. I asked John, is time travel theoretically possible? If you actually look into the equations of general relativity, which is the best description of the universe we've got, the best description of space and time, you find that there's nothing there which says that you can't travel backwards in time or that you can't send a message backwards in time. And the way the scientists got into studying this was because, in fact, it was Carl Sagan, who, who was writing his book Contact, who wanted to put wormholes, as they're called, into the story, and he got in touch with Kip Thorne, who's sort of the world guru on general relativity, and asked him, look, I know this is impossible, but can you dress it up for me in some fine-sounding language to make a good story? And Kip and his students went into it, they looked at the equations and they sort of struck themselves a metaphorical blow on the head and said, my God, you know, you can build these things. There's nothing to forbid them. And so it was literally an idea from science fiction which stimulated the research by the relativists, which led them to find that you can uh, construct these things which are like uh, two black holes joined by a tunnel through good old hyperspace, the thing we've all read about in science fiction for years and years, and jump in one end and pop out the other one last Thursday or in the year 5 BC or whenever it might be. Now, it's very difficult, you know. I mean, the practical problems of building something like this are immense. He's not kidding. No one's even proved black holes exist. Kip Thorne, the relativity guru, has a bet with physicist Stephen Hawking on whether or not the binary star Cygnus 1 is a black hole. The winner gets a subscription to Private Eye or Penthouse. Oh, I know. Dr. Gregory Benford is a physicist and a science fiction writer, and in his 1980 Nebula award-winning novel, Timescape, he sidestepped wormholes and still sounded convincing. Ah, oh, Greg, it's Commander Rick. Can you explain how in Timescape, the character Gregory Markham concludes that time travel is possible because the equations of physics are time-symmetric? Well, strictly speaking, 
physics is time symmetric in the sense that all the classical equations r can run forward or back. All you have to do is state the initial conditions, run it in one direction, see what happens. The only thing in all of physics that has time irreversibility in it is the second law of thermodynamics, which says that in any interaction, the degree of disorder will at best remain the same, but, but in the vast host of cases will increase so that you can tell the arrow of time by the increase in disorder. But at the level of particles and so forth, there uh, is in the equations no second law of thermodynamics. Right, so that let you have particles that move backward in time. Do particles like that really exist? I thought if anything actually went into the past, we'd end up with all sorts of strange paradoxes. There is a particle called a tachyon. We hypothesize exists. I say, yes, it does exist, and if so, first thing that a scientist would do would be, say, not try to build some kind of chamber and send himself backward in time, but just to send a message. Just sending the message can create a paradox. Um, you tell your grandfather to do something that makes it impossible for him to meet his grandmother, for example. But in this novel, the timescape, in a sense, splits in two, and you get two outcomes. One in which the, say, the, uh, the grandfather never made you and you didn't exist and therefore the message didn't come back. The other one in which the grandfather didn't get the message. Something failed. And, or there may be other choices. You don't know that it only splits in two. It could be three, four, five, ad infinitum. Uh, the whole idea behind the book was people were doing experiments to, to see if tachyons could be detected. If they were detected, then here came this immense problem. And, and in a sense, I was working out in the novel the physics that would be necessary to explain this problem if tachyons were found. So far, they haven't been, not reliably, though some experiments have turned up some evidence that they might be there. Well, I'll keep my eyes open. Thanks, Greg. Mm, I guess we'll have to wait for the experiments to catch up with that theory. That's right. Jeffrey had tachyon-free time travel in his Nebula award-winning story, Ripples in the Dirac Sea. Why did you draw upon Paul Dirac's work for the time travel in Ripples in the Dirac Sea? I really wanted to write a story that had some modern physics in it. It seems that most of science fiction often kind of, st kind of stops after Kepler and Galileo and Newton, and they understand the laws of rocket mechanics and orbits, but don't go much further. That even the science fiction that deals with quantum mechanics really stops with the quantum mechanics of the 1920s with Schrodinger and with Heisenberg and doesn't go on to the very fascinating quantum mechanics that Dirac developed in the quantum field theories. Yeah, the only other story I recall that used Dirac's work was James Blish's 1954 story, Beep, about a faster-than-light communicator. You obviously did a lot of research into Dirac. How did he come up with his unusual theory? He came up with an equation and then he said, well, what does this equation mean? It seems to be right, but what does it mean? And the only way that he could make it mean something in the real world was to postulate that all around us, we are surrounded by an infinitely dense sea of negative energy particles. Everywhere inside of you, inside the Earth, all around us, in empty space, in space that's packed with matter, everywhere there's this infinitely dense sea of negative matter. And another interesting thing that was pointed out was this, these negative uh, energy states. Uh, in quantum mechanics, negative energy formally corresponds to states that move backwards in time. Okay, it might be possible, it might not, time will tell. But what draws SF writers to time travel isn't its scientific possibility, it's the amazing narrative potential. Writers who've done time, time and again, include Harry Turtledove, Philip K. Dick, and Robert Silverberg, whose latest is a collaboration updating Isaac Asimov's classic, The Ugly Little Boy, in which a Neanderthal child is plucked from the past for scientific study. Bob, it's Commander Rick. How did you and Isaac explain the fact that time travel didn't create huge paradoxes in The Ugly Little Boy? We lied. Time travel really is, uh, is fantasy, uh, unless you subscribe to the, uh, the, the tachyon theory of, of small particles moving backward in time. I suppose you, you have a mathematical substructure that makes sense. But the rest of it is a convention 
that we employ to get on with the story. So you don't feel any need to provide those sort of scientific explanations like Greg Benford did in Timescape? I think we need to distinguish between scientific explanation and science. Uh, Greg is a physicist and has the vocabulary of science uh, greatly at his command. I'm a science fiction writer who has picked up much of this vocabulary. It's not my native language as it is with Greg. He knows, as I know, that it's all nonsense, that we are working with arbitrary literary conventions. He found better wallpaper to put on than most of us can do to disguise the cracks in the walls. But in fact, time travel is a very uh, chancy concept. When uh, I wrote a book called Up the Line, which I think is, is my fundamental statement on the issue of time travel, I tried to explore in a, a comic but serious-minded way all of the paradoxes of time travel. If everybody goes back to, to see the crucifixion, the hill on which Jesus and the two thieves was crucified will be covered with millions of tourists. Sure. This is a paradox that needs to be addressed. I addressed it. I addressed it thumb to the nose in some ways, uh, but I tried to play with all of this. This is part of the fun of science fiction, the intellectual game. Once we begin to delude ourselves into thinking that we're literally predicting the future, we're fit to be taken away. Right. Do you have a favorite time travel story, something maybe you wish that you'd written? Well, I think the favorite has to be H.G. Wells' uh, Time Machine, which is one of the two or three stories that led me into science fiction in the first place. Uh, the, the vision of the far future, I don't mean the L.O.I. and the Morlocks particularly, all of that was wonderful stuff. I mean the journey that the time traveler takes to the end of time. I keep talking about the, the, the red sun and the crab crawling on the beach. I was 10 years old when I encountered that, and I thought, I will never live to see these things. Who will? But here he's showing them to me anyway. And that has stayed with me in over the last 45 years and more as uh, the great time travel story. But also there's uh, Robert A. Heinlein's By His Bootstraps, uh, very different in its effect because it doesn't attempt particularly to conjure up the wonders of the distant and unimaginable future, but simply sends the same character on a series of time loops. And this showed me what the intellectual side of the time travel story could be like. If I had to pick one that I wish I had written, I think it would be By His Bootstraps. The one that I would regard as my favorite would be The Time Machine. Great choices. Thanks, Bob. By His Bootstraps is also one of Spider Robinson's two favorite time travel tales, according to his tribute to Heinlein, entitled Raw, Raw, Raw. Spider told me about his other favorite Heinlein story, All You Zombies. Well, it's, it's essentially a science fiction dirty joke and a good one. It's the man who was his own mother and father uh, through the agency of a time machine and a simple sex change, uh, sort of a born hermaphrodite who functions as female up until she becomes impregnated, has a child, the stress of giving birth completes the transition from female to male, whereupon she meets a time traveler who picks her up, puts her, he now, sorry, he meets a time traveler who picks him up, puts him in a time machine, brings him back, and allows him to impregnate himself. Then they jump ahead nine months in the time machine and take the baby girl that results and bring that back in time so it can be, grow up to become the girl who is impregnated by herself so that she can give birth to herself so that and the man with the time machine has done all this in order to recruit our hero into the time police so that one day he can become the one who will make it possible for him to impregnate himself and therefore be born there's a complete closed loop in time a story in which if any of the events in it had not taken place none of the events would exist it ends with the protagonist the agent of the time police, now a grizzled old veteran who's just finished making it possible for himself to exist, he goes back to the barracks and he lays down in his bunk and he looks down at the Caesarean scar on his belly and says, I know who I am, but who are all you zombies out there? Uh, that's, that's, that's elegant, that's beautiful, that's perfect, and, and as so often in perfect science fiction metaphors applied, Robert got there first. Another wonderful short story about time loops is Kate Wilhelm's Nebula award-winning Forever Yours, Anna, in which a handwriting expert falls in love with a signature that hasn't been written yet. 
And in the Nebula award-winning Schrodinger's Kitten by George Alec Evinger, an Arab girl is entangled in overlapping loops of diverging futures. Boy, Nancy, the Nebula awards sure love time travel, don't they? Oh, that's right. Joe Haldeman's Nebula winner, the Hemingway hoax, has a writer who is, well, as a professor who travels in a... No, let's call Joe up. He wrote it. He can explain it. Hi, Joe, it's Rick. Can you synopsize the Hemingway hoax? Well, I know it's a, it's a toughie. It's a real short book. Yeah. <laughs> the plot synopsis is about a there's a professor, a Hemingway professor at the University of Boston, and and he comes up with the idea that uh, he could write Hemingway's lost novel. Uh, Hemingway, in real life, Hemingway lost all of his first three years worth of work. His wife Hadley put them in a in a uh, suitcase and went to meet him in Switzerland for skiing, and somebody stole the suitcase. And so he lost all of his early work, and people have been looking for it for 75 years. Well, my guy decides he could type up these stories on a 1923 Corona. Right. And uh, do them on sufficiently old paper and say, by George, I found these in an attic in Paris, and make millions of dollars. The problem is, when he starts this, this guy comes, this guy appears in a railway car and says he's a, sort of a time policeman. He's actually a literary critic with a license to kill. And he says, you must not do this. If you do this, I will kill you. And he says, oh, yeah, sure you will. So he kills him. And he reappears in another universe where everything is slightly different. They have DeSotos in this universe. and, and uh, uh, Reagan was killed by an assassin, and George Bush became president, and the United States went to war in the Middle East and so forth. And, and he lives these two past simultaneously. Well, he writes another couple of pages of this book, and here comes the old Hemingway policeman again and kills him again, and then he reappears again as a third person. And he, the same people are in his life, but they're changing. What he doesn't realize is he's changing too. The, everybody is going in various asymptotic patterns. The, the bad guy is becoming more and more purely evil. The good girl is becoming more and more purely good. And he is becoming Ernest Hemingway. What inspired you to write such an intricate story? Was it sparked by one of Hemingway's tales? My model for the book was uh, Robert Heinlein, not Hemingway. Heinlein's stories all you zombies and... Uh, uh, by his bootstraps. Great time travel paradox stories. And I love Hemingway's writing, and I'm fascinated with his life, so it was a lot of fun to be able to use that as uh, material. And it, I enjoyed writing these little pastiches of the lost Hemingway stories, too. Well, they were fun to read. Thanks, Joe. Mm, don't mess with Mother Nature or Father Time. There are problems and paradoxes and emotional complications. In Kit Pearson's recent novel, A Handful of Time, a young girl from Toronto whose parents are divorcing is transported back to meet her mother as a child. The book is big in Japan. Maybe they figure Patricia's a sci-fi Anne of Green Gables. In Kurt Vonnegut's hilarious and heartbreaking Slaughterhouse-Five, Billy Pilgrim is a victim, unstuck in time by the horror of the firebombing of Dresden in World War II. And the Blitz bombing of London is the setting for Firewatch, Connie Willis's Nebula award-winning novelette about students who leap back for a lesson in history and end up learning about life. In Connie's new novel, The Doomsday Book, her protagonist, Kivrin, travels back to England during the Dark Ages and the Black Death. Connie, it's Commander Rick. Why do your time travelers like Kivrin tend to get their hands dirty messing with the past? Well, I think one of the, one of the things that I try to deal with in my time travel books is that um, you can't be a detached observer. There's no such thing. Um, time travel novels in which you're not allowed to lift a finger to prevent oh, an animal being beaten to death or, or a child being killed are, are I don't think, realistic because um, I think that you would have to develop the I am a camera mentality which would turn you into sort of a monster. The detached observer is in, in fact a monster and nobody 
I don't think anybody had ever thought about that. The air that you breathe, <laughs> the air that you breathe out, these things affect and change the past. So, so you have to cope with that, you know, somehow. I mean, those are, that's why we have the paradoxes and why we probably could not have time travel. But um, if you can't overcome them, you can't write a time travel novel. <laughs> so I did the best I could. But Kivern, I think, faces the, the problem that she must... Um, she must not be detached, but she must not be sucked in at the same time, and it's an impossibility. You can't, you can't be fully involved in the past. It can't be alive for you unless you truly um, let it hurt you. Well, you really feel for Kivrin. She's always fighting the temptation to tell people that humanity will survive the right. plague. Right. Yeah, that's the one thing she can't... She has a, a true advantage in the, in the Black Death, which is... She knows what's going on. She understands what the history is. She realizes that, that although she doesn't know the fate of these particular people, that she does know the fate of the world, and that it didn't end. And that is a theme that, that we are children in the dark. We, we don't know how it's going to end, and we are caught in, in our own time um, without having any idea what, you know, it's so easy to look back. I love books that are written about the 1930s and say, well, it's clear that, you know, the specter of war was rearing its ugly head here and here and here and here, and you're going, yeah, well, it's clear now, but it wasn't clear then. And that's, the, that's what people were trying to cope with, was they, they didn't know what was significant or not. You know, we're probably focusing on AIDS in the ozone layer, and we should be paying attention to some little two-inch uh, news story about something totally different that is actually the crucial event that, that later on we'll look back and we'll say, well, if, we, if we'd been paying attention, we would have realized. But that's what living in time is like, and that's, I think, uh, time travel gives you the opportunity to have, to show that if you have a perspective on time, uh, you have a tremendous advantage, while at the same time you still remain a prisoner of your own, your own pr time, your own story. You still don't know the end. Well, you once said you'd be happy spending the rest of your days just writing time travel tales. In fact, I read you're now working on a time travel comedy? Yes, I hope so. One always hopes with comedy. Um, yeah, I decided I couldn't take the plague anymore, and it was time to do the flip side of time travel. I think there are many very funny aspects, particularly when you get into people who are, are um, messing, with, messing with time and then thinking that they can fix it. And, of course, fixing it will only make it worse, as in all good comedies. Um, I have a, a time traveler who has gotten badly time lagged because he has been going back and forth between the present and the past and he's been passing you can't be and you can't be in the same place twice but you can be very close and the closer you get um, the more time lag symptoms you're going to show so he's been doing um, he's been excavating um, the remains of Coventry Cathedral right after the Nazi bombing and as a result he's just a wreck um, and so they send him he thinks on R&R &R to Oxford in the 1880s so that he can just rest in peaceful Victorian England, do a little boating on the Thames, calm, restful, peaceful. Of course, this doesn't quite work out the way he'd hoped. He isn't actually there for that at all. He's actually there to try and rectify a disaster. And uh, the disaster, everything he does to rectify it only makes it worse. Um, and lots of, I hope, there will be lots of fun. And the title? The title is To Say Nothing of the Dog. Or how we found the Bishop's Bird Stump at last. <laughs> okay, thanks, Connie. Thank you. Time travel allows authors to play with problems of logic or satirize cultures or show that individuals making small actions can make a difference. The past may or may not be close to us, but science fiction authors have a device that allows them to live far into the future and to talk to people who aren't even born yet. These devices require no batteries and they fit in your pocket. Unless, of course, you buy the original hardcover editions. It was in Warwick Castle that I came across the curious stranger who I'm going to talk about. He attracted me by something. Next week on Second Nature, a new study shows that men have larger, heavier brains than women. The extra mass is apparently used to remember sports scores. Plus, black holes in space. Could they account for the salt missing from your dryer?
You have selected Club Dave, the future of TV. Here are your viewing options.